Christian church. Uh, I, I got a little worried there when it says Christians joined the singing and y'all weren't singing. But I, I, I guess the words we were, all right. I'm glad you're here today. I missed you last week. I was at one of the other churches I'm responsible for down in Edinburgh, but uh, heard great things happen. I heard you kind of got motivated because willing to step up into a position of uh, uh, leadership helping wise. Um, believe me, everyone can be a leader. If you, for example, after worship, if you're just picking up some things and you see someone sees you doing that, they start helping you clean up, you're, you're a leader. All those various jobs are all important, so thank you for all the ways you can help. We need, we need assistance, and please see me, see uh, Pastor Cindy. Um, we could use you. The body of Christ needs you. Uh, we started our second uh, service uh, this morning, so I heard some different times being suggested this morning, but... Our first service starts at 9 a.m. That's early for those of us, all of us, I guess. 9 a.m. down in the chapel. Uh, contemporary service goes about 45 minutes, kind of laid back, loose, uh, but wonderful. 9 uh, o'clock, that starts. The service, obviously, at, at 10.30. Um, tithes and offerings. We put the plates in front for that so you can come up and give as you are... Uh, able to uh, give. I want to pray for us uh, here in a second. We're also starting Sunday school this week. Uh, so thank you for those of you who bring in your children for Sunday school, bring in your grandchildren, bring in your neighbor's kids for Sunday school. Thank you for doing that. Uh, we're actually going to dismiss the kids at the same time we're taking the offering. So when everybody's up and moving around, we'll We'll grab the kids. I think Sandy's in the back. and shoot her hand up, and there she is. Okay. Um, so we'll take the kids down. Thank you for trusting us with the children. We want to teach them uh, the biblical truths, but in a way that they can understand um, and, and grow and learn. So we thank you for bringing them. A um, million other things flying through my head, but I know the first thing I want to do is pray. So let's do that. Lord God, we thank you for this day which you have given to us to rejoice and be glad and we thank you for how your goodness fills all of our days we are blessed people Lord God so we all be most grateful and giving people uh, bless the tithes and offerings given today thank you for all those who are giving God bless them incredibly and we pray Lord today for those who are unable to give or unwilling to give Lord touch their hearts change their lives be with them we pray in all things may you be glorified through this time of giving back the portion meant for you in Jesus name we pray Amen. Again, the children will be released.
Good morning. Good morning. Today's scripture lesson comes from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. A call to persevere in faith. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. As you see the day approaching, the day of Christ's return approaching, it's coming soon. Does that mean a thousand years, a hundred years, five minutes? I don't know, but it's coming. We can see the signs of it everywhere. Yesterday, we remembered the 20th anniversary of what? Saw those images on TV once again, and I'm reminded of where I was, you know, where you were. My youngest son, Caleb, is born July 28, 2001. He's about five, six weeks old when that happened. Hard to believe it's been 20 years ago. And I mourn for those who still mourn. World's never the same. And I remember what church looked like that Sunday. It was packed. People I'd never seen before. Because I realized maybe, maybe life is not so sure. Maybe I better make things right with the Lord. And I remember the first message I preached 20 years ago on that Sunday. Let me just read these few verses of scripture because this was the text. It, I think it speaks to us even today, 20 years later. Jesus was talking to a group of his enemies. And they were trying to ask him, listen, does God punish us for our sin, like every time we mess up, this guy like punishes us, he's just out to get us, right? Because when someone, something bad happens to someone, that means God is mad at them. And if something good happens, then God is happy with them, right? Is that how that works? It's not how it works. Bad things happen to good people. Those people in that tower did not deserve to die. They didn't do anything, they weren't worse off than us. So I looked for a scripture that would kind of encapsulate that, and here it is, Luke chapter 13. It says, there were some present at the time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. What the heck does that mean? Galileans were going to church, they're going to worship. They brought an offering with them. And Pilate had them all killed for going to church. And they mixed their blood with the blood of the offerings. And so here's some people who are going to church to worship. And they die, tragically, unexpectedly. And Jesus said, do you think that those Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? Right, they deserved it somehow? He said, no, I tell you no, exclamation point. But unless you repent, you too will perish. And then watch this, I think this is interesting because I've often said there's never a situation in your life that's not found, the answer's not found in scripture. Did you know a tower fell down in the Bible and killed people? Listen to this. Or what about those 18 people who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no, exclamation point. But unless you repent, you too will perish. Tower of Siloam is kind of an aqueduct on the south side of Jerusalem. 18 people went to work, went to their jobs, and the, the tower fell and killed them all. 
And the people asked Jesus, why did that happen? Did they deserve it somehow? Were they worse sinners than us? And Jesus said, no. But unless you repent, you can't be sure. We don't know what's going to happen five minutes from now, five years from now, 50 years from now, 20 years from now. We don't know. What we do know is it's important to keep right relationships with God. To repent, that means to confess. I'm not perfect, and neither are you. God is not up there looking to catch you doing, wait for you something wrong and stomp on you and say, ah, I got you. Now I'm going to punish you. That's not how God, God, God is love. But God wants us to trust in him, trust in his righteousness, trust in his hope. Do you think there were worse sinners, people in that tower, people in that car accident, people in that hospital? You think there were sinners? No. But unless you, unless you repent, you too. How about we pray together? Lord God, I... I hear these words and I, 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 I realize the brevity of life. There are no guarantees. Hey, Lord, we pray. I got a funeral this Tuesday. I got a funeral this Wednesday for members of this church. Because we never know. Whether it's 50 years, 100 years, we never know. It's short compared to all of eternity. And what matters is that we make the right decision. We get in a right relationship with God. We love our families, we love others, but we trust in you for salvation. So God, this morning I pray for all those lives tragically, innocently lost. I pray for the horror that occurred 20 years ago. But I pray for the horror that occurs even today. People are still dying. Loneliness, of heartbreak, of hunger, of lack of shelter, of lack of friendship. It's tragic. People right today are dying in their sins because they don't want to come to church. They don't want to trust in Jesus. So God, give us witness, ability. Give us courage to tell people about the greatest thing that's ever happened. Thank you for this life you've given to us and help us realize there is no guarantee of tomorrow. So what we have is today, to worship you with all we have, to love each other the best we can, and to seek and ask your forgiveness for all that we have done and not done. We pray, O oh God, for health, for wholeness, for every need and concern that walked into this place. You know our hearts, you know what we ask for. God, be quick to answer, we pray. And we pray this in the name of the one who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Yes, the choir is back, in the beautiful color blue. Yay, God!
Thank you, Quiet, reminding us that God is a rescuing God. Isaiah chapter 40 says, when you get tired, you can't move on any further. You run and not grow weary, you walk and not grow faint. God will lift you up and hold you in the palm of his hand. It's a great assurance. It's also a great assurance to know that when we confess our sins to God, the Bible says he is quick to forgive. I'm so glad of that. I can be such a screw up sometimes. I make so many mistakes and so many different things. I'm so glad God didn't give up on me. I said, ah, that's enough. No more chances. You're done. We're done. I've often said, I'm not sinless, but I should sin less. And again, I try to be a little better today than I was yesterday. But I need forgiveness. We all need forgiveness because we all sin individually, collectively, as a nation. So I'm going to pull up, uh, if I can put on the screens here for you, this prayer of confession, assurance, and pardon. I read to you from Luke chapter 13, where Jesus said, unless you repent, you too shall die. My earthly life at one point will end, but I live forever. I'm an, I have eternal life. I live forever and ever and ever and ever. And I want that for you. I want to say, God, here I am. Here's all the people I brought with me. Here they are. We keep short accounts with God. We don't let a long time go before we just say, forgive me, God. It's a humility thing. It's being humble. How about we read this together? Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. May Almighty God have mercy on you. May he forgive all your sins through our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. May he strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Amen. When Jesus gathered with his friends, his 12 disciples, the night before he was to lay his life down for them. He wanted to give them kind of a memorial meal that they could remember and reflect upon. And so he didn't run out and get anything special. He took what he had there in front of him. He had some bread, a glass of wine. And he used those ordinary elements to describe his life and his death and relationship with him. The bread he took and he gave thanks to his father for it. For even Jesus understood that everything, every good and perfect thing comes from God. And he broke the bread and he said to them, this bread is symbolic or representative of my body. It was broken for you. The scripture says, by my wounds you are healed. By, his, be, by him becoming broken, we become whole. He says, this bread represents my body. And as often as you can, remember how much I love you. That you can be forgiven, and whole and free. 
carry the weight of all of our sin and all of our mistakes and all of our junk and he nailed it to the cross forever. After the meal, he took a cup, signifying the fruit of the vine. He says, this cup represents or is symbolic of my blood, which will be shed for you and for many for the forgiveness and remission of sins. And as often as you drink from this cup, remember that nothing washes away the sin and stain of the world except the precious blood of Jesus, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And he says that often as you take this bread and drink from this cup, remember it's me screaming through these canyons of eternity, I love you, I forgive you, you are mine. And he calls us home. Lord God, I thank you for this most sacred and holy meal that we've set apart this memorial meal that you once shared with your disciples and you will one day share with us in that great banquet table in the sky. But for now, God, may these elements become for us the body and blood of Christ, that we who partake of it may be filled, forgiven, and free. May it be so, I pray in the beautiful name of Christ the King. Amen. I think I have some folks helping me this morning. I'm going to serve you. Can I make the way here?
God, we thank you for the invitation to the table of communion. May it become for us a beautiful reminder of how precious we are in your sight and of what you've called us to do and become. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.
So, uh, I have my message notes. I hope and trust you do too. They look something like this. Um, they're made available to you as we kind of move through uh, the message this morning. Well, this series I've entitled, Some Assembly Required. First time I ever went to a fancy concert hall, my first symphony ever. I was all excited because I heard all about it, how wonderful it would, would be. Sat down and the music started and it sounded horrific. What I learned later is that everyone warms up their instruments at the same time, but no one's really playing the same thing. It's just this cacophony of sound. And it's like, oh my gosh, that was supposed to be a beautiful harmonious sound and it's just, ah. And then the conductor came up and tap, tap, tap. And then it was beautiful. Then the music came together and it created something beautiful. Jesus actually calls us to be a symphony of people. Not individual artists, but to come together as a symphony. In fact, it says in Matthew 18:19. If two of you agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together, agree in my name, there I am with them. And the word here, literally the word Greek, means, it's where we derive a word, symphony. When we come together in unity, we're, we're in agreement before the Lord in our lives and in our ministry and our worship together. The combined effort is like that of a symphony. And the unique notes of our life make up this orchestra. But unfortunately, again, we have a lot of solo artists. People kind of doing their own thing, right? Independence is rampant in our society. We guard it. We protect it. Self-reliance says, I don't need church. I can worship on my own. I'll fellowship with my TV. I'll watch some preacher on TV. And we'll call that good. Or I'll worship on the golf course, or on the boat, or, or worship can become quickly and quietly one more weekend option among so many things. So many different things we can do, that's one option is going to church. And the hectic pace of life makes it seem like the gathering of people is more like a, a filling station. Where we can just refuel our souls other than a community of people we can invest in, we can draw from. And maybe you thought, and I, I've wondered myself, is worshiping with other believers really that important? Can I just be the Lone Ranger Christian, right? I, I got this on my own. Can't we just praise and glorify God as easily alone? But you see, worshiping together, and I get it, I'm kind of preaching to the choir, I'm preaching to people who are already in church about the importance of coming to church. I, I get that. But hear me, because I think there's at least three major reasons why we should continue to worship together. Again, I remember back to that Sunday after 9-11, the church was packed. And as each week progressed, few and fewer people came. And I bet if I looked across this state, there's a whole lot of churches just like ours. It seats about 800 people, and they got about 50 people in attendance. And it's really sad because people have stopped realizing the importance of worshiping together. Why should we worship together? Number one, you can write this down. It is God's idea and it's God's desire. God's idea, God's desire. You look at the first five books of the Bible, God was very concerned about the way his people worshiped him. God prescribed all of the elements of worship, the construction of the tabernacle, later the temple, down to the smallest detail. You want to know what the, what the priests were going to wear. He specified everything. And as this young nation entered the promised land, Moses reminded the people they're not to worship like other nations did. It's going to be different this time. Don't just offer sacrifices whenever you want. Instead, they were designed to worship God in a specific designated way. Ultimately, that place became known as Jerusalem. And the entire nation was required, commanded to come together three times a year. 
these big festivals to worship the Lord. The Israelites' worship was inherently communal. It's an event that encompassed all of God's people. So this idea of worshiping by yourself would have been utterly foreign to the Israelites. In fact, such worship was often the result of rebellion or, or stubborn independence. Because when the Israelite people would stray spiritually, the nation was often filled up with practices and ideas of all the pagan people all around them, and that was not God's design for worship. Worshiping with other believers was not always convenient. But you think it's hard to make it to church on most Sundays? Do you ever consider the inconvenience of the Israelites? The, the three worship holidays meant they had to be weeks away from home. You got to come to Jerusalem, but I live weeks away. I could travel by a horse. Or, yeah, you got to be here. It's important. Get here. God seems entirely comfortable with requiring such sacrifice of bringing his people together. But I got to get up early. I can't make the big breakfast I want. I gotta, that's, that's okay. We're going we're gonna to survive. God is entirely comfortable with bringing his people together. It's his idea. It's his desire. Luke 13, 34, God says, I long to gather you together. He wants us to be together. Jesus' last prayer was, may they be one. May they be unified. May they be together. Number two is this. It reflects God's own nature. It reflects God's nature. Remember, God is a, a trinity, right? A com God is a community of persons. Think about this. Imagine this. There has never been a moment in all eternity where a single unrelated being has ever existed. Never. One of the implications of that truth is this. The American idea of the self-reliant individual is an illusion. If God is three persons, what makes us think we are singularly complete in ourselves? I need you, you need me, we need each other. God has made us fundamentally incomplete. We are designed to find our completion in relationship with him and with others. Jerry Maguire, you complete me, the man says to the woman. God completes us together. Together we form a community, this symphony that makes beautiful music together. That reflects God's communal nature. No matter how wonderful or how thrilling those private moments of worship may be, they can never replace being in a church with the voices singing, the choir singing, the organ. There's something about that. 1 Corinthians 12, 2 says, together we are a body. You need your eyes and ears and nose. I mean, you need each other. It's God's nature. One body, so it is with Christ. If Christ is community, so are we. Number three is this. It brings God joy to gather his people together. That's the third reason we come together is because it brings God joy. I love this. Scripture from Zephaniah 317 is one of my most favorite verses in Scripture. The Lord your God is with you. He's mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. Watch this. He will rejoice over you with singing. Do you ever have that image? Again, oftentimes we think as God is that those long guy, big beard, dragging on the ground, sitting on a throne, right? Just waiting for someone to screw up so we can. My Bible tells me that God is rejoicing over me and God is singing. God has joy when his people come together. Imagine the Lord dancing among his people while they praise him. That's the joyful picture Zephaniah is painting here. God takes great delight in his people gather. Some assembly is required. It's, it's important. Closing verses of Zephaniah reinforce that idea. Concludes with a promise that demonstrates God's desire to gather his people, especially those who've been isolated or separated from each other, political oppression, uh, exile, physical infirmities. Listen to this. It says, at that time, 
God said, I'm, I'm working on this. I'm bringing this to, to, to fruition. I will deal with all those who oppressed you. And I will rescue the lame and gather those who have been scattered. At that time, I will gather you. At that time, I will bring you home. God wants his people to be together with him, to be home with him in a community of faith. It's to be home in a very real sense. You know what this is? Kind of practice for heaven. That, that's what we're doing here. In a very real sense, this is home. We're but aliens and strangers here in this world, but when we sing, when we shout, when we rejoice together, we rehearse for life in our heavenly home. There are tribes, and peoples, and nations who have worshipped him throughout the centuries. We'll do it all together as one. Jesus' prayer that we would become one. John Wesley had this dream that he got to heaven, and he asked the Lord, Lord, founder of the Methodist Church, as you probably know, uh, how many Methodists are in heaven? And God said, none. He said, ooh, Baptists? How many Baptists? None. Lutherans, Protestants, Presbyterians? None. Just Christians. They we're all together. We're not segregated. We're not separate. We're all together. That's why it bothers me so. All these half-empty churches everywhere. Church of the Amens. We're the Church of the Amens. We're the Church of Baptized. We're the Church of... It's all different. I said, why don't you just get together? Why can't there be uniformity? All the nations gather together and the people assemble, bottom of the page left there. That's God's desire. That's God's plan. It brings God joy. So what are those, if those are three reasons, what are three benefits that we should continue to worship together? Three benefits, I'll list them quickly. Number one is this. It nourishes and sustains our faith. It nourishes and sustains our faith. I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. Coming together gives us a chance to celebrate and embrace our shared identity as God's people. We gather at the table, we gather in worship, we, it reminds us, it nourishes our faith. Chapter 10 of Hebrews, God said, Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. He must have looked ahead to 2021. Some people in the habit of not getting together. But let us encourage one another. I, I, I love, look at this, in fact, I've underlined them for you. Look at all the verses that say, let us draw near. Let us hold hope. Let us consider. Let us not give up. Let us encourage. It's all about coming together. Let us. The writer of Hebrews understood that we come together as a people worshiping God who has forgiven us. We're able to encourage one another to press in spiritually, to persevere, to, to maintain our hope. Apart from each other, we get discouraged. Satan loves, it's like that, that one person in the pack who's, who's away, all, isolated all by himself. Good, Satan can pounce on them and attack them. That's why we need each other. We come together because it nourishes us and it sustains us. When we neglect that priority of church, we separate ourselves from the faith-sustaining work God does through his gathered people. Listen, I, I worship individually too on my own throughout the day, but there's something about Sunday. Man, I love Sundays. And sometimes it's a long time between Sundays because the world beats us down and wears us out and I get exhausted and I can't wait for church to get filled back up again. I need it, it sustains me. Number two is this. Worshiping together gives us a unique opportunity to experience Jesus Christ. To experience Christ. When we come together, Jesus is actually in our midst singing praises. It's a, and again, oftentimes we say, Lord, you know, come into this place, or Lord, join us. And he's saying, I'm already here. You don't have to invite the Lord, the Lord is already here. We just become aware of his presence around us. Worship is not about God's response to us. 
Worship is all about our response to God. He's all around. He loves you. He cares about you. He's, he's helping you. Let us go to the house of the Lord, David said frequently. I rejoiced with those who said, let's go to the house. We experienced the glory of his presence uniquely in a symphony of worship. There's something really special about it. We need to be in church. Last point is this. Number three. It fuels our passion for his purpose. It fuels our passion for his purpose. In him we were chosen that we may be for the praise of his glory. God's got a unique plan for each one of us. He's got a purpose for your life. How do I know what I'm supposed to be when I grow up? How do I know what I'm supposed to do? Should I marry? Should I move? Should I whatever? The purpose is found when the gathered community of God's people, that's where God speaks. That's where we learn. That's where we grow. In Acts, when the people got together, that's when they were filled with the Holy Spirit. That's when they were empowered to do what God has called them to do. How do I, I know you want me to do something, God, but I don't know how to do it. Church gives us the strength, it gives us the power. Some assembly is necessary. We need you. The church is less when you're not here. If you can physically be here, we need you. We want you here. We love you. God loves you. There's value in the church. Next week, I'm going to talk about friendship, and I want to encourage you to bring a friend to church. Maybe it's someone who knows the Lord, maybe it's someone who isn't. We don't, we're not trying to steal sheep people from other churches. There's plenty of people who aren't going to church anywhere. But there's something really special about coming together. If you want the church to grow, and I know you do, who'd you invite this week? Who'd you invite last week? In this past year, how many people you invited to church? They might say no. Yeah, they might. Or they might say yes. You're probably here because someone invited you at some point in your life. Let's create a culture of invitation. Let's be here together. It's important to God. It's important to you. Let's pray together. Lord God, I, uh, I thank you for the church. It's not a building. It's a people. It's a body of believers. And Lord, these are some incredibly wonderful people. Thank you for letting me get to know them. Thank you for being a part of their lives. I'm growing and I'm learning and I'm changing because of them. There's something that happens in church that's just indescribable. We thank you for that. Touch our hearts, God, to make a commitment today that we are going to be people who attend. Not individual Christians, but a beautiful symphony that makes beautiful music together. May it be so, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. More notes are in the back for you to consider some questions to ask, but I invite you now to stand as you are able and let's sing our closing hymn together.
I do hope to meet you again. I remember my mother echoing in my ear. I said, I don't want to go to church. She said, God gives you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can't give him an hour to sit down and worship him for all he's done. I hope to see you again. God loves you. I love you. Have a great week, church. Peace. Thanks for coming. Thanks.